So in this video in our ECG series, we're going to talk about the QRS complex and what it actually represents and what are the normal parameters of the QRS complex. Firstly, we're going to talk about what the actual QRS complex represents. So when you see this pattern on your ECG, what you're actually looking at is you're looking at ventricular depolarization. So the QRS complex represents the depolarization of both the left and right ventricle together. And it is an electrical representation of this uh, physiological event on ECG paper. So in terms of what the actual components of the QRS complex um, are, the first part generally of the QRS complex, if present, is the Q wave. And typically the Q wave is seen in lateral leads, such as leads 1, AVL, and V4, V5, and V6. And it is pretty much considered to be representative of the depolarization of the ventricular septum. Um, the Q wave really is a downward deflection at the start of this complex. So it's a negative deflection of the complex and is known as a Q wave. Later we're going to discuss pathological Q waves which are often seen in acute myocardial infarctions or heart attacks. But for now I want you just to focus on small Q waves which are seen in the lateral leads and are a result of septal depolarization. The next part of the QRS complex is the OR wave or the OR part of the complex and this is a positive deflection upwards that represents depolarization of the left ventricular uh, myocardium. The reason we refer to the left ventricular myocardium here is because it's generally bigger in size and bulk than that of its right side and therefore, generally speaking, it overlaps or obscures depolarization of the right ventricle. After the QRS, rather the OR wave of the QRS complex, you're going to see another downward deflection, and this is called the S wave. And this represents the final part of depolarization of the up high lateral wall of the left ventricle. Um, and once this is completed, you have completed ventricular depolarization. So to summarize, the Q wave represents septal depolarization. The OR wave um, refers to both ventricles depolarizing, but generally represents the left ventricle because it's bigger in size and mass. And the S wave represents depolarization of the high lateral wall of the left ventricle. So how long should a QRS complex last for? Well, when you look at the ECG paper, it should last between one and a half to two and a half small boxes or between 0 0.0607 to about 0 0.10 seconds. In terms of when you look at the progression of the QRS complex um, in V1, V2, V3, V4, V5 and V6, known as the precordial leads, you should see an increase in the size of the OR wave as you move from V1 to V6. So looking at V1, you'll see a small OR wave and a deep S wave and that's due to the fact that that lead looks more at the septum and the right side of the heart rather than at the left side of the heart. As the actual, well, as the actual ECG leads change the position from where they look at, for example, in V4, V5 and V6, which look um, at the left side of the heart, you're obviously then going to see a bigger OR wave because those leads are placed over the left ventricle and therefore and we'll be measuring uh, the electrical potential or the vector of that potential at its most greatest point. And therefore the OR wave, which is representative of left ventricular depolarization, will be seen greatest in these lateral leads. And while the converse will happen in that you'll see the S wave um, becoming less prominent and sometimes absent in these leads, particularly as you move towards V5 and V6. So what we're looking at here is OR wave progression, and that refers to increase in OR wave as you move from V1 to V6, and it's seen most prominently in V4, V5, and V6. So briefly, we're going to touch on some different um, morphologies of the QRS complex in order to give you an idea of the different abnormalities that can take place. So when you have a narrow QRS complex, which would be a QRS complex less than 0.1 um, seconds in length, that indicates that the actual origin or the stimulus for the QRS complex is coming from above the ventricles in the atria. And this may be um, 
when you look at the QRS complex, if it's um, if a P wave comes before it, a normal looking P wave, that indicates that the sinus node is the main driver then of the QRS complex. If you get an abnormal P wave, again, this indicates that it's coming from the atria itself, but it may be due to atrial fibrillation or a flutter wave. Whereas if you have um, no P wave at all, or a P wave that's very close to the P or uh, that has a very short P or interval, or a P wave that is very close to the onset of the R wave, this indicates that there may be excitation close to the AV node itself. So a, nor a narrow QRS complex or a normal QRS complex may be due to sinus rhythm, which is a normal P wave. It may be due to atrial fibrillation or flutter, which will have those abnormal P waves, which we'll speak about in the coming sections. Or it may be due to junctional or nodal excitation, where you get an abnormal P wave and that P or interval is shorter than what it normally should be. Conversely, you may also see broad QRS complexes, and there are a number of reasons for these. So a broad QRS complex is a complex greater than that normal range for a QRS complex. So recall that the normal QRS complex should be between 0.06 to 0.1 seconds, and therefore a broad QRS complex is greater than 0.1 second or 100 milliseconds. And there are a number of causes of this. Um, the most common ones you'll probably see are bundle branch blocks, or abnormal ventricular rhythms, such as, uh, for example, a ventricular tachycardia, where generally speaking, you'll see no P waves at all, and the QRS complexes will be broad. But there are other causes as well you may need to be aware of, uh, apart from the bundle branch block or abnormal ventricular rhythms. So um, in patients who have abnormally high potassium levels, such as hyperkalemia, a width widening of the QRS complex is something that's also seen in these patients. So that's really all you need to know about QRS complex duration. The final thing you might need to know about is in terms of the voltage of QRS complexes. So let's discuss the voltage now in the next section. So QRS complexes have a certain voltage. Typically, in the limb leads, the QRS complex voltage or amplitude should be greater than five millimeters. And in the precordial leads, because they're closer again to the heart, you should be seeing a greater amplitude of these, co of these um, QRS complexes. And therefore, they should measure greater than 10 millimeters in length. So in the limb leads, they should be greater than five millimeters in length. And in the precordial leads, they should be greater than 10 millimeters in length. Um, so when actually you find a QRS complex that's less than 5 millimeters in the limb lead or that's less than 10 millimeters in the chest leads, what you're actually seeing there is a low voltage QRS complex. And there are a number of causes of a, a low QRS complex um, that you might need to know about. Probably the most important ones are in patients who have, um, for example, Distended body walls, so patients who, um, for example, have an effusion of their pericardium, who may be obese, who may have air um, in their lungs trapped, so sp patients with a pneumothorax or emphysema, um, or patients with a dilated heart, so a dilated cardiomyopathy. They're generally the main causes of a low-voltage QRS complex. Probably the most important one to think about is a pericardial effusion. Not only will the patient have a low voltage QRS complex, but the actual voltage will alternate um, in height. Um, and this is due to um, the heart moving back and forth in um, the pericardium, which is full of pericardial fluid, an abnormal amount in this case. And therefore, at some points, you'll get a better contraction than normal or a closer contraction of the heart to the chest wall and therefore a better transmission of the voltage of that actual contraction to the ECG leads. So that's really what you need to know about in terms of low voltage and we'll discuss those actual conditions in greater detail as we move through this ECG series. But now I'll get you to turn your attention to high voltage QRS complexes. Um, and these typically occur in patients with hypertension and who develop left ventricular hypertrophy. And there are a number of criteria that are used to define a high voltage QRS complex or to define really left ventricular hypertrophy on an ECG. Um, one of the most common ways is to measure the depth of the S wave in V1 
and the height of the OR wave in V5 and V6. And if this is greater than 35 millimeters or seven, or seven boxes, then you have fit the voltage criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy. And that's an important point to make as well, because while you fit the voltage criteria um, for left ventricular hypertrophy, it's not diagnostic, as patients often on an echocardium of their heart don't have evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy. So in order to make the diagnosis, not only should you really have the voltage criteria, so um, an OR and S wave together greater than 35 millimeters, but also you should have an echocardiogram that supports your findings.